Hi everyone. We're just gonna wait a couple of uh, a couple of uh, minutes to let people uh, join, and then we're gonna get started. Okay, so I think we can we can start now, and uh, uh, people can still uh, trickle in. Welcome everyone to the Health Law Institute seminar series. Um, we have an amazing lineup for uh, for this year that are convening. Our speakers are convening around the theme of health equity and uh, beyond recovery. My name is Adelina Iftene. I am the associate director of the Health Law Institute here at Dalhousie, and it is my great pleasure to introduce. Uh, uh, our first speaker today and to moderate the discussion. Um, before I do that, there are just a couple of uh, housekeeping rules that I would like to share with you. Uh, first of all, this, uh, this uh, seminar is recorded. Uh, there won't be the attendees that are not gonna appear on the video. It's just gonna be um, our guest and uh, myself, but uh, you are gonna be able to uh, rewatch this on the Schulich School of Law's uh, YouTube channel. Now, the other thing is that we do have a uh, closed captioning. So if you're not seeing that automatically on your screen, uh, you have a button, uh, a button at the bottom of your screen uh, that you can, uh, you can uh, uh, change to uh, turn closed captioning on. Um, the other, the other um, thing is that we have, uh, we are using uh, the Q&A box for, uh, for the discussion today. So uh, feel free to add your questions in the Q&A box at any time. Uh, during uh, our guest presentation, and uh, we are going to uh, to I'm going to uh, come at the end and uh, put the questions to uh, uh, to our guest. So, without further ado, I'm going to introduce the, our uh, our guest today, uh, Dr. Kifa Rahman, uh, who has uh, over 12 years' experience working in global health. She is uh, presently uh, a permanent NGO representative on the WHO Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator, uh, representing global NGOs in meeting with heads of global health agencies in the global COVID-19 response and in various working groups on COVID-19 country support. She was also formerly a board member for NGOs at uh, UNITAID, working on equitable access to HIV, TB, malaria, and cervical cancer tools. She has been on numerous missions uh, to uh, HIV facilities globally, including to early infant diagnosis programs in uh, Mozambique, uh, HIV self-testing programs in rural areas of Zimbabwe, uh, dissuasion commission programs in Lisboa, and needle and syringe programs in uh, Scott County, Indiana, at the height of the HIV pandemic epidemic. As founder and principal consultant of the global health consultancy Matahari Global Solutions, she is currently working on strategy development for TB organizations on mapping access to COVID-19 uh, tools in uh, low and middle uh, income countries and um, in, uh, in mapping opportunities in the, uh, in the right uh, to health for Amnesty International. We are uh, very lucky to have uh, Dr. Rahman here today with us, and she is gonna talk about um, the lessons in inequity that uh, COVID-19 has uh, uh, globally created. Thanks very much for that introduction, Adelina, and I'm looking forward to engaging with you all. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and then we can just get right into it. So, um, first of all, I'm going to sort of um, introduce you to the ACT Accelerator and um, let you know a little bit about um, what my role is and what I do. Um, so this is the structure of the ACT Accelerator. Uh, and the ACT Accelerator obviously stands for the Access to COVID Tools Accelerator, 
which you know it hosts hosts also the Covax underneath it. You probably know Covax a lot better than than the other pillars, just because it's been such a focus. Um, the Covax is was designed to deliver vaccines um, to countries. Um, in particular, twenty percent um, of their population should be vaccinated, um, and that was the initial target set. But there are other parts of the ACT Accelerator that you should know about. There's a diagnostics pillar, which I sit on, the therapeutics pillar, and the health systems connector. Um, and there are several other bodies uh, within the ACT Accelerator, um, which are important discussion forums. The Facilitation Council is one, and I also sit there. The Facilitation Council is hosted at the WHO. It is chaired by South Africa and Norway, and that's usually their ministers of health. And it's where the member states sit. And um, this happens every few months. And the member states, usually represented by the minister, and if not officials close to the minister uh, of the countries in question, um, present on their priorities, th their concerns, and, and what they need. Um, and then there's the principles group, which happens every Thursday. I also sit there. And the principles group is where the heads of the agencies are. So that is where um, Peter Sands from the Global uh, Fund sits. That's where Dr. Tedros sits. Um, that's where um, whoever who, who's the head of an agency um, associated with the ACT Accelerator um, sits there. And of course, there are organizations outside the global health, like the IMF, the World Bank, and other folks that sit there. So what my, what's my role um, in, in the three places that I sit, the Facilitation Council, the Diagnostics Pillar, and the Principles Group? My role is to basically consult with civil society on all the technologies. So I deal with diagnostic therapeutics, vaccines, and health systems, um, and basically hold people accountable. So, uh, you know, for example, yesterday, the US government was present, uh, presenting on um, Biden's uh, proposed um, vaccine summit coming up. And um, um, they said something about this, uh, this new Biden um, initiative as needing to bolster collective accountability. What I did was I basically said, um, uh, yeah, uh, bolstering collective uh, accountability is important, but one of the things that civil society will be needing and, and, and thinking about as we come to the summit that is occurring in the next two weeks is about USG accountability. And that would be as regards deployment of vaccines to the global south. So, so there are things that I call out and at the facilitation council, a member state might say something that I would call out or I would compliment. And an example of this is when the government of India said we are completely self-sufficient on diagnostics. And that was important for me to call out because we know for a fact that um, people in India don't have enough access to diagnostics. Uh, unlike us in the global north where we have these um, COVID self-tests um, at home. Um, I don't know what it's like in Canada, but at least in the UK, we, we can order them free um, uh, over the NHS and it comes to your house. But of course, they don't have this in India. So it's important um, to, to call out. Uh, those are just two examples of my role in keeping um, in, you know, countries and agencies accountable. Um, and, and let's go into the detail, right? So the next slide is talking about how inequity is perpetuated. Um, and this is an important slide to set the, the tone for this whole presentation. As you remember, there are, there are four pillars of the ACT Accelerator. And unfortunately, in the working group meetings, so under, under each pillar, under diagnostics, there are working groups and, and therapeutics working groups, vaccines working groups health systems working groups and that's where we work on the nitty-gritty stuff right we work on um uh, you know what particular diagnostics are being deployed we work on strategy on these diagnostics we work on and of course there are there are manufacturing working groups in in the vaccines anyways let's spare the detail um 
But the important point is there's almost no low and middle income country involvement in those working groups. And, and why does this perpetuate inequity? It's because you have the distortion of priorities. And I'll give you a couple of examples on why this needs to be improved. Um, and, and the first example is probably on the DRC and South Sudan vaccine return to COVAX. So uh, I don't know how many of you know, but what happened was vaccines were deployed to Democratic Republic of Congo and South Sudan. And unfortunately, they were unable to deploy. This despite vaccine readiness tools completed in advance. Um, those vaccines were sent back to the COVAX, which of course takes time, effort, money to return. Um, so, so my contention is this, and my, and my, my theory and, and uh, my belief is this, is that if we had African experts frequently consulted, as frequently consulted as we consult experts in the global north, in these discussions, this wouldn't have happened, right? Because you have that expertise, you, could, you, you have that contact in DRC where you could go, if we give you five days notice to send you these vaccines, will you be ready to deploy? Will your community health workers be ready to deploy? Will your provincial leadership be aware that the vaccines are coming? You know, do you have the information systems to register people? You know, all that kind of stuff can be asked to the person if they were included in the working groups, right? There's also issues with insufficient lead time to arrival of vaccines in country. And this was illustrated by a presentation we had from WHO Somalia, um, this brilliant doctor. And he, he said that, um, that there were five days of notice between the deployment and the arrival in country. Now, if you know anything about health systems um, worldwide is that they vary. Um, and one thing that the COVID pandemic has taught us is that even the most developed countries in the world, uh, like the United States and the United Kingdom, might mess up on health systems. They might mess up on the COVID response and resulting in lots of deaths. Five days is not enough time for any country, um, you know, especially a, a country like Somalia. But despite this, they successfully deployed um, and consumed 90% of their vaccines. And I actually have a slide on this, um, but I'm telling you now. So I'll show you the slide in a second so we can um, talk about that in more detail. Another thing is about this new requirement that Gavi or the Vaccine Alliance is um, using, was using, that's a July 15th slide, in their next uh, deployment of vaccines after July, which is assessing country absorptive capacity. So if, you, if, if your country is assessed to have less absorptive capacity, you would get less vaccines. And I remember the conversations on, on the call where this slide was presented, and there was a lot of concern from major global health agencies and major global health thinkers that this would be inequitable because just because your absorptive capacity is less does not mean you deserve less vaccines. If your absorptive capacity is less, there should be efforts integrated immediately to improve that absorptive capacity to reach a certain level. And, and what was promised in the COVAX was that 20% of populations would be um, vaccinated. So there's obviously real concerns about that. Um, and of course, the inequity today exists for diagnostics as well, and I'm sure therapeutics, even though I engage less on therapeutics, just because we're still waiting for the for therapeutics to come in and come in at affordable prices. So obviously, I just showed you my, um, my antigen self rapid tests, which I have in my home and at my work table, and I can do them, you know, every time I decide I want to go out to a bar or a restaurant. And um, the situation in the global south is very different, right? We don't, you know, there's a real inequity in, in testing because I can do it twice a week if I want. And um, 
you know, some people are not being tested at all. So there's clear problems with, with how that works. Now, there's an article there that I've put right at the bottom that sort of illustrates the lack of LMIC involvement. So Pascal Andoa is a diagnostics expert. She's from the African Society of Lab Medicine. And she said in this Lancet article, and the DOI is there, I'm not sure if slides will be shared, but um, uh, look up the article. It's by, an, uh, by a journalist called Andania Asha in the Lancet. And she said the current format of the consultations could be improved to provide the right enabling environment for LMICs to bring their priorities forward and shape the agenda. So, so it's really important that pandemic responses going forward, because this won't be our last pandemic, um, invest in the equal intellectual partnership of LMICs. And, and this is really, really important. And I'll speak about this further. So this is um, a slide from last week on the COVAX supply forecast. Um, and I circled there that we're expecting um, a further 1.1 billion doses to become available for delivery between September and the end of 2021. So I did a rough calculation, um, September to the end of 2021, that is 120 days approximately, and 1.1 billion doses divided by um, 120 days, that's about at least 9.5 million doses a day that need to be deployed, which is monumental. And the question is, how exactly is the COVAX going to deploy this? You know, there are real logistical concerns with um, the idea that we are, we're going to be able to deploy these 1.1 billion doses by the end of the year. So these are some of the critical questions that we're asking. And, and uh, you know, in, in my meeting yesterday, and yesterday was Thursday, so it was the principals group, um, you know, the, you know it's, it's clear that these things are probably going to stretch into 2022. So uh, another interesting thing that is coming out of the supply forecast is that Gavi is, is changing its tone a little bit. And, and we've, of course, been demanding sort of transparency, increased transparency on delivery schedules, because it hasn't been clear to us when, say, you know, pick any country, when is Haiti going to get their next tranche of vaccines? When is Somalia going to get their next tranche? When is Mozambique going to get their next tranche? That's not clear to us at all. And it's not clear to Gavi, because what's been happening in the recent meetings with Gavi is that they said that they are demanding increased transparency from industry because industry is not being transparent about when the vaccines are coming. So overall, there's a lot of opacity in, in, in how people are doing things. And this, is, this doesn't bode well for timely a timely pandemic response. And this does not bode well for, in, for equity. Um, and we're working every day to try and change this um, and try and be a voice of accountability. So I wanted to address hesitancy because some people have tried to make it an issue um, for LMICs. And by some people, I want to call out the Pfizer CEO, right? Who said that even if we made the vaccines available, and I'm paraphrasing, um, there'd be too much hesitancy and they, there would be no consumption. So this is so problematic on so many levels. And of course, there's plenty of hes hesitancy in the United States and in France, but there's something underneath that is underlying people's comments about Africa and about the developing world on hesitancy. and. Um, this article by Tian Johnson is really worth reading because there is no doubt that there is racism ingrained in, in what people are saying. Uh, there is racism ingrained in the systems. 
right? And to the ACT Accelerator's credit, um, and particularly the diagnostics pillar, I think, um, and um, the Foundation for Innovative Diagnostics, which has been um, more engaging with CSOs and um, we've been able to shape their agenda more there. Um, um, they've actually introduced country roundtables where countries are speaking and they can exchange their views and more can be learned from them there. There's also more being done on the principles group by the chair of the principles group, which is Carl Bildt. He's the fi former finance minister of Sweden. And, and, you know, there's been invitations to LMIC experts and, 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 and things like that to try and improve engagement. But, but it's curious that these things were only done sort of one year into the pandemic and it happened only this year and, and the act has been running for one and a half years now. So, so there are real concerns, right? So, so we've been talking about hesitancy a little bit. And, you know, the, the fact is, it's not so much an issue of hesitancy, but more of an issue that the supply isn't there. There is inequity in supply. And you've, I'm sure you've heard the term that people are throwing around, around it's vaccine apartheid, right? And there's a real problem with the global health architecture as is on COVID and not taking advantage of community health workers and their role. Now, of course, we could unpack this a lot more, but community health workers are largely unsalaried. The only global health agency that I know of, and, and people can correct me if they know of any others, but um, Global Fund is probably the only global health agency that salaries community health workers. And, uh, you know, every, every other agency provides them sort of a travel per diem um, for, for the work that they do. And the community health workers are very important. They were very important in the Ebola response when they tackled hesitancy there, right? And, I feel like the ACT Accelerator hasn't adequately invested in community health workers. Now, why hasn't this been? So, so what's also needed is sort of a shift in funding, right? Because everyone, vaccines is a sexy thing, right? It's a sexy thing. Donors are, are, are putting all their money into the investment of deployment of vaccines. And unfortunately, the health systems connector on the ACT Accelerator hasn't sat for weeks, months now, I think. Um, and community health workers come under them. And it's incredibly important that community health workers are funded. And of course, health systems isn't just about community health workers. It's about, uh, my apologies, I have a, a parcel apparently, but I'll keep talking. So, um, it hasn't sat for weeks and the health systems connector is really about um it, it's about electricity it's about wash it's about um wash meaning water and sanitation and um all of that it isn't just um community health workers and all of these things need to be tackled you know we've got situations like in iraq where um the, the they had a major fire in the hospitals and and um, including in the COVID wards and a lot of people died, and that was caused by an exploding uh, exploding oxygen implement. That's a health systems issue, right? So these are issues that are incredibly important, and the fact that the health systems connector isn't funded is a problem. Now, of course, why isn't it funded? Um, there are governments in the EU who have given as much as 50 million euros to the health systems connector, but we don't know where that money necessarily is. Has it been rerouted to um, vaccines? You know, there's, there's a little bit of, of, of um, uh, lack of transparency that we, we would like to see further in terms of budgets and things like that to make sure that um, all the pillars are adequately funded and technologies can be deployed. So another question that's important and, and you know, obviously I, I remember the days when I was doing a master of health law and I was, um, 
I was thinking very much about these difficult questions. And, and one of the difficult questions that should be thought about is this issue of who decided that the COVAX would only um, vaccinate 20% of, of populations of these countries? 20% 20, 20 how, you know, was it a practical decision in terms of were they thinking, okay, um, rich countries are going to monopolize the market for vaccines so we can only reach 20% of LMICs um, populations? you know what was the bar for that and i get it i get i get that you don't want to go okay we'll vaccinate 100 percent of populations uh, 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 like you know just announce it like that i'm, I'm sure there's some rationale behind it but 20 percent isn't enough and 20 percent is going to create whole populations in the global south that are at risk for um um, creating new variants, which are of danger to the North, right? So how does this make sense? So these are important questions that need to be um, asked. This was a slide that I already spoke about um, in advance, but um, that I wanted to show you. This is the um, slide um, on the deployment in Somalia and 90% of the doses were administered despite having um, only five days uh, notice. But you, you, you would think, you know, if they had more days, how much more could be deployed? And uh, Somalia is of course a country with a large mobile population. Um, so, it, you know, it, there are concerns also around, you know, what if people don't have a home? What if people are moving? Um, to different areas, you know, how, how are you going to make sure that you administer two doses? Um, but one of the th things that was quite clear from this presentation by WHO Somalia was that the, the role of the community health workers in reaching out through the communities and bringing elderly people to the vaccination center, bringing um, mobile populations, migrant populations to the um, vaccination center. Um, the role of the community health workers is incredibly important. And this is where health systems overlaps with vaccines. Um, the next slide is gonna show something quite stark as well. So um, the number of people um, who received the vaccine um, in a particular age group of five, 50 years and above, only 23%. So yeah, um, it's only 23% uh, okay, female were only 18% out of that group, right? So, you know, there's a clear disparity um, in terms of gender. So why are females being less vaccinated? And this is, this is why it's sort of so important to take an intersectional approach when we're analyzing um, any global health issue really, um, especially in vaccine deployment. So women often don't, um, they have limited decision-making power on their health. They might not own the transport that is necessary to get there. Um, they also are primary uh, caretakers of families and, and may not have a place to put their children for while they get the vaccine. There's so many things that affect access to vaccines and gender is quite clearly one of them. So um, this, is, this is switching to, to um, diagnostics. And I wanted to show you this because the, the inequity isn't, isn't just related to vaccines. And I know people are probably raging at this point um, about, about vaccines, but I'll make you rage even further. Um, there have been a number of bottlenecks, right, in, in deployment of um, rapid tests in particular. And rapid tests are important, especially when you have vaccine inequity, because uh, it helps people control their own risk, right? And it helps economies stay open. Um, so if you are, you are a truck driver um, delivering supplies over borders, 
um, it, it would be important for you to have a test done. It's important for care home workers, as you, as you you've probably heard, like in the UK, so many uh, care homes um, had so many COVID deaths. And um, my husband works in a in a care home, and um, he um, gets um, uh, he has we have so many rapid tests just in our home. Um, it's it's uh, it's probably a lesson in, in inequity in our, in itself. Um, but he gets tested once a week with PCR, and um, you know he can test many times a week um, with with rapid tests. So it basically keeps the economies open. Um, it helps people manage risk while while there still is vaccine inequity. Um, so what happened um, in the ACT accelerator is there was a diagnostics capacity reservation, which sounds fancy, but all it means is that um, the ACT accelerator reserved manufacturing capacity volumes of the rapid test for two companies for supply under the ACT accelerator. So they booked the manufacturing space basically. Um, as time progressed, it became quite clear that countries weren't taking up the diagnostics as quickly as they should, right? There was quite low demand for the rapid tests and everybody was like, why? So uh, what happened was they commissioned a study to look at bottlenecks. Um, you know, what are the key bottlenecks? What, what, um, what are the issues? Why, why are countries not asking the ACT Accelerator for rapid tests? So there were a number of um, uh, reasons um, that countries gave, which are um, listed there on your screen. But one of the things that I kept hearing, because my job is to outreach to people in country and, and, and ask what's going on. And one of the things we kept hearing is that WHO guidelines are too restrictive. It doesn't allow us to use the tests for what we want to use them. So this was interesting because this was WHO being about the bottleneck, right? So what we did was we had a look at the, um, the guidelines and I'll tell you that about that in a minute. But what was clear was that we needed decentralized decentralization of testing. And these are some of the things that countries said, right? So um, a, a Kenyan guide, interim guide for antigen rapid diagnostic tests said only qualified registered and licensed medical laboratory officers can carry out the tests. So community health workers would be able to, to, to use these tests, right? I mean, these are really easy to use. I mean, just follow the instructions, you can do it yourself. You can report it, at least in the UK, to the NHS, whether it's negative or positive through your, uh, through your phone. And of course, there are questions about the digital divide and what about people living in poverty and, and not being able to report it. But anyone can do these tests, they're not very hard to do. Um, so the fact that some countries had quite conservative interpretations of who could and still can, they, you know, a lot of countries still have conservative approaches to antigen rapid tests, is a, is a real impediment for making sure there is empowerment on testing in the global south. So there's COVID-19 testing in South Africa and that should be conducted in authorized labs only. Uh, samples to be collected by trained healthcare workers. Now, this language is, is a little bit better just because um, there's some room for interpretation, right? Um, if you're trained to deploy it, and if you're a community health worker, you could potentially do it, right? Uh, but it has to be conducted on site rather than at home, which is, you know, you know what we want is for tests to be able to, to be done in communities, especially for marginalized communities, people who use drugs, internally displaced people, all, all these kind of people, you know, they need, it's better for these tests to come to them in their communities. And a key challenge there is that the community health workers um, aren't empowered to do this. So, um, that's obviously a, a, a real problem. 
this is the letter that I signed and wrote to the WHO about my concerns with the testing guidelines that they were too restricted to certain use cases and use cases is just the word to, to say, you know, where they're being used, right? Um, and we were concerned about the inequity resulting from this. Um, and this of course went to Dr. Tedros, Maria van Kirkhoff and Dr. Sumia, who is the chief scientist of the World Health Organization. Um, and of course this letter, uh, went to them after uh, a principles group call where I was uh, I was raging about it. Really, I was just like, "This is this is really problematic." WHO's guidelines are a bottleneck, and um, we we were of course really quite concerned. And one of the things that was said to us was like, "If you interpret the guidelines, you can um, you can use these tests in communities." And my problem with that is that if you need creative interpretation to do something in your country, the guidelines are not good enough, right? So that was the concern. And this was quite a long letter. You can read it if you like, uh, or use it for your essays and dissertations or lectures. Um, but as you can see, the date on that is 9th June, but this resulted in a lot of discussion. On 16th June, and I'm just letting my cat out, on 16th June, um, the WHO issued um, these infographics. So um, the infographics are um, important because we'd been making so much noise on communities um, living, we wanted the test to get to communities. And if you look at these infographics, and we also in the letter we demanded, um, we wanted to see um, um, uh, visual um, tools, right? Sorry, this is, this is, I expected this and I told Adelina that this might happen. Um, so um, as you can see, it says there that um, they are looking at communities where there's ongoing transmission. So um, our letter was on 9th June. This happened on 16th June. So um, it's quite clear that um, our work is, is resulting in something, right? Um, I, I don't think this language is clear enough, but it's a step in the right direction. So um, it, it's really qu quite important to keep going on this work and to make sure we have testing everywhere. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is oxygen. Now, we all know about the oxygen crisis that happened um, in India and the deaths that occurred from that, but there are oxygen crises happening every day in multiple countries. Uh, now, this is a very busy graphic, um, obviously. Um, but as you can see, the countries where, which are displayed in red um, have high and rising oxygen need. So you've got India, um, Iran, um, they've got Serbia, um, Mongolia, you've got Costa Rica, Palestine, Ukraine. Um, there are lots and lots of countries that are struggling with, with, with high oxygen needs. So um, there's a lot of oxygen inequity as well. Um, and what are lessons from this? Uh, because I am supposed to talk about lessons and not just <laughs> be a series of, of complaints or, or concerns. Um, the, the top um, oxygen companies in the world, they're, they're all based in the global north. So there's six of them that includes Air Linda and, and a number of other um, um, oxygen um, producers. And um, there are real opportunities for building more facilities in the Global South because there are gas companies in the Global South um, who are producing um, nitrogen and things like that for industrial use. Um, and oxygen is really a byproduct. 
So the question is, how do we decolonize and decentralize and make sure that countries in the global south um, um, have uh, manufacturing capacity? Um, there's a lot that needs to be done on supply chain and health systems issues and, and to make sure that this improves for the next pandemic. Um, but as you can see, it continues to be a major problem um, across the world. I wanted to go to therapeutics as well. Um, and um, molnupiravir is, um, it's, it's, there's a lot of buzz around how, um, how brilliant it is. Um, and sometimes this buzz didn't turn out. There's a lot of buzz earlier about Gilead's remdesivir, but that turned out to be just incorrect. And, and we don't use remdesivir today for um, COVID. But there's a lot of buzz around molnupiravir because it can be used um, as an outpatient treatment. Um, and what does that mean? That means um, someone gets diagnosed with COVID um, potentially at home, right? If they have rapid self-tests, they can do that at home. And um, they um, could, I don't know, in a health system have um, a doctor uh, come to their home and deliver the molnupiravir to them, reducing the risk of them spreading um, COVID to others and infecting others. And they could be treated within the home. So it's exciting. Right, um, and this is where health law comes in in the intersection of intellectual property. So there were volunt voluntary licensing agreements with five generics, um, Indian generics manufacturers to accelerate the access to molnupiravir. And um, it's, you know, there's a lot, there was a lot of critique coming out of this because and now I can't remember how many countries allowed it to supply it to, but it was, I think, 105 countries or something like that, um, who would get access to the generic molnupiravir. But there are more than 105 countries in the world. Um, who chooses these countries? Um, are countries like Russia included? Probably not. Are countries like China included, where there's a massive poverty pro problem um, included? Um, are middle income countries included? You know, there's a lot of questions about um, equity, which is really what this presentation is about. Um, and there's a lot of questions on whether compulsory licensing would be better. So what is the difference, right? A voluntary, volunt voluntary licensing is basically where the company voluntarily does it, right? And compulsory licensing is where uh, usually the country, uh, the country who wants the cheaper generic medicines has to negotiate with the company um, to say, okay, are you able to give us a cheaper price, right? And if the, country, country, the company goes, no, we can't give you a cheaper price, um, then the, the, uh, the country can override the patent and they can issue a compulsory license and depends on which country, whichever ministry does it. In, in Malaysia, for example, it's a trade ministry that issues compulsory license. And um, what happens is, um, you know, it overrides the patent, which allows the generic manufacturer to manufacture them at a cheaper price. So a lot of people were saying, are compulsory licenses better for this kind of situation? Um, and it depends. I mean, I'm all for compulsory licensing. I think a lot of these things are publicly funded with our tax dollars and pounds and, um, and, and whatever currency uh, um, it is. And, you know, should there be a reckoning um, and a return on investment um, to the people, right? Because people are putting the tax dollars into this. Um, should should these be sold at, uh, at the prices they're sold at? So that's that's one of the things um, that are that is obviously of concern. Uh, and I wanted to go to health systems um, now. And obviously, I've talked about health systems throughout because. Health systems is so linked to every one of the issues that we've discussed so far. 
Now, I told you earlier that the health systems connector, which is one of the pillars in the ACT accelerator, has not sat for weeks or months, right? And health systems connector in the start of the ACT accelerator last year when we had the pandemic, um, the start of the pandemic, if you look at what this article says, um, the ACT accelerator focused on medical oxygen and PPE, which are components of clinical care. They're not really health systems. And this year we saw oxygen move to the therapeutics pillar, which is, you know, it is a treatment. It's, it's one of the most effective treatments for COVID and um, it belongs in, this, in the therapeutics pillar. That left PPE within health systems, but health systems isn't just that. I, I, I told you this before, health systems is making sure community health workers are out there in the communities bringing people to get vaccinated, um, you know, participating in health education, telling people about the risks uh, of certain things, bringing tests to people, right? So community health workers is a major thing that wasn't addressed then, but um, we know that the health systems connected today, while it hasn't sat for some time, is doing rapid assessments on what countries need. So this is a start but it, it needs to be, I know they're rapid assessments, but it needs to be quicker because health systems are falling apart and it's really important that they are sorted or strengthened. Um, it's, it, it's a big task, but it needs to be done. So one of the things that we're asking for is more transparency in the health systems connector. And, um, you know, it's, it, it's incredibly important because what, what have you got, we've got on the screen right now is a matrix from July 2020. And I told you about the working groups that happen in the Health Systems Connector, and I know there's a lot of technicality in it, but this was the community-led responses um, work stream. And there's several priorities in there. There's the need to improve basic infrastructure at um, um, public health um, facilities, including WASH, which is water and sanitation, um, and hygiene, electricity, connectivity, um, scale up of training for frontline services, availability of PPE. So this is just some, I, I only took a tiny snapshot of what the priorities were in July 12, uh, 2020. We're at September 2021, and I don't know, and I, I'm, my job is to know a little bit about everything, right? To, to this date, I don't know the progress on any of these deliverables. And I'm having conversations with these people all the time. So what happened to this matrix? Why have we not strengthened health systems in a way where they're supposed to? Um, you know, it's it's a real problem. And I get the whole argument that this is our first rodeo, right? This is our first rodeo, we're gonna mess up. But, but we also need to ask questions and keep people accountable. And this is one of the key questions, right? What happened in health systems? Now there's some, um, and I keep emphasizing community health workers because it's so essential. And this is such a good article to read because um, Madeline Ballard did this time series analysis and she found that community health workers who were equipped and prepared for the pandemic were able to maintain speed and coverage of community delivered care during pandemic period. She also points out that community health workers globally remain unpaid and unsupported, um, which I mentioned before. Um, and the paper that suggests that the opportunity costs of not professionalizing community health workers may be larger than previously estimated. So there's a major gap in the fact that we don't invest in community health workers. And this is one of my final slides, I think. Um, and I, I'm not sure where I am on time. Um, that's an hour, um, um, but, but important to end here. This is a slide from yesterday. Um, it shows that to deploy the amount of doses we need to deploy um, by the end of 2021, um, health systems have to be uh, four times um, um, stronger, right? Um, and how can that?
be done. I mean, it says on the right um, field there, health systems must be, must be ready to deploy more doses than accustomed to in the past, which is nice to say, right? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a nice uh, aspiration. Um, it's an important aspiration. But how do we do that when health systems aren't adequately funded? Um, it's important and there's no kind of roadmap on health systems um, uh, in the COVID response and it's concerning. So final slide um, is that there is an ACT Accelerator strategic review ongoing um, and I've been interviewed for it um, and um, it should be out soon. Um, one of the things uh, that I was concerned about and the question that I got by the consultants was what kind of structure do we need to consult LMICs? Which I think is so loaded and problematic because we don't really have a problem consulting white global north experts. We just email them. There's this thing called email, it's miraculous. We don't have problems going to this professor at Boston University, hey, what, you know, I'm concerned about X, Y, Z. What, you know, what can you tell me about this? We need to do that for LMICs. I, I don't know why we're not doing that. And pe you know, people think like, oh, to, to consult LMICs, you need some kind of special structure, some kind of integrated structure, which is great. I mean, if you want to do that, do that, but you know, it shouldn't be in a tokenistic kind of way. Do, you know, it shouldn't be the, the way I foresee it, it. It's as if that structure is reserved for the comments of LMICs and it happens once a month or, or whatever, when you should, you should be consulting regularly. And if there's a problem in DRC, you should have that expert in DRC ready to, in your WhatsApp to go, hey, um, I'm concerned about this. You know, I, I, do you think community health workers are ready? Do you think, you know, how many days do you need to get the vaccines? What's the situation with your rapid tests, right? Um, which leads to the larger question of um, the fact that we need to decolonize global health architecture and we need to um, quite clearly make some basic statements to, to people running things, right? Um, you know, why? Why didn't you consult a DRC expert? Why didn't you consult somebody in South Sudan? Why didn't you do that? Um, so there are real problems with global health architecture that need to be tackled, and and they make they are uncomfortable questions. They make they make some people quite constipated, especially when we say things like racism or, you know. It, but it, it it's important to mention because it distorts priority. Uh, a pandemic response for the future needs the equal intellectual partnership of LMICs, it needs that indigenous knowledge. And until we learn how to do that, until we learn how to make friends in the global south and, and send those emails and, and, and not feel the need for any specific structure, all those structures are important as well, we're not going to be as effective as we would like. Thanks, and I'm happy to, to get questions. Thank you so much, uh, FIFA, for that uh, amazing presentation. Um, I would like to encourage people to use the Q&A box now uh, to, uh, to ask questions. Um, we already have a couple of questions here. They are from Matt Herder, who's the director of our uh, Health Law Institute here. So um, I am going to... Um, I'm going to read out the question just so everybody can hear it. Um, uh, Dr. Ragman, you can you can see the questions as well in the Q and A if you if you need a visual. Um, so Matt says, "Thanks for a for a wonderful thought provoking presentation. It really helped me to understand how the accelerator operates. My question is about this governance. You noted the example of the Pfizer CEO making problematic claims about vaccine hesitancy in Africa. Industry is represented within the accelerator." What happens when industry representative, representatives make such comments which others uh, engaged in the accelerator likely disagreed with? Did that slow the work of the accelerator? Did it fragment it? How were tensions among the different actors with conflicting interests mediated? 
More broadly, I'm curious about your reflections on how to improve the governance of pandemic responses in the future, given the division between public and private actors in the global north and the global south. So um, these are such important questions. Um, so industry has multiple times. So industry is in the principles group as well. Um, and um, there, there was actually a moment where, and it was brilliant. And, and, and I, I have so much faith in the WHO DG. And I know, you know, there's been some horrifying articles out there about his competence and his links to China and all sorts of crazy things. Um, um, but this was about um, making sure manufacturing of vaccines could occur in the global south. And um, Thomas Cooney, who is the um, uh, from the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers, said the language was not appealing to industry, um, something along those lines. Um, and Dr. Chedros made an impassioned speech for equity. Um, and it was, it was very important um, for him to say that. There are things like that. Um, but your question was on how to improve governance. It, it's a lot of things. It's, I mean, industry has its uses, right? I mean, they are the ones producing the vaccines. Um, but at the same time, you know, governance needs to be improved so much. And, and for example, the vaccines pillar didn't have CSOs uh, till much later. Um, all the other pillars had civil society much earlier. Um, and and the, the answer in the global south and the global north, that, that unfortunately requires us to engage with, with questions that make us uncomfortable. Um, and I know Michelle Bachelet, she said we need to tackle systemic racism to uproot it. And that's it, racism. And, and it's, it's funny how many people just recoil at this word. They're okay with diversity and inclusion, but they're not okay with the word racism. And it really needs to be sorted because it's endemic in global health. Um, and um, governance structure-wise, um, it's it's um, it's hard to say because in 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 the actor there isn't just one decision-making um, pl uh, place. You know, it it happens across multiple um, working groups. It happens behind the scenes. It it happens at the facilitation council. It happens at the principals group. They happen everywhere. And maybe some kind of specification as to where decisions are made would help. Thank you. Um, we have another question. Um, so thinking about the period in between pandemics and epidemics, what are the policy levers uh, and strategies that might help to ensure equitable access of infectious disease uh, interventions? And then there is an explanation here. Um, in asking this question, I'm thinking about how universities and other public research institutions have let us down. The lipid delivery system that uh, is integral to Pfizer and Moderna vaccines came out of the University of British Columbia. And UBC's tech transfer office has been lauded for having strong principles of global access. Yet, none of those principles seem to have been applied to ensure that the delivery system could be licensed out to entities in the global south. So if university won't follow through, at least not voluntarily, what other strategies and policy levers might be deployed instead? I think it's a really good question. And I'm thinking immediately of the WHO transparency resolution um, um, and how we, we need more discourse and how the global health ar architecture is broken and how the voluntary system doesn't work. Because we had this wondrous, um, transparency resolution well not wondrous because i know a lot of things were deleted from it um but in the end it said that that countries would commit to being more transparent about the 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 costs of r d the ori origins of r d into into uh, global uh, medical tools and and you know like uh, and and to to relate the cost to 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 that right um so uh, 
but you know what what has been the progress on the transparency resolution what accountability mechanisms has been on has has occurred on that we don't know if you know which countries have been more transparent with with uh, you know where you know where these tools came from and you know whatever is in the transparency resolution needs to be applied to universities as well like what what did you contribute to this you know how much of your money is publicly funded um, you know, why, what's the recipe, right? And, and one of the things that we're thinking about is, um, uh, you know, what there should be is a whistleblower blowing line, either hosted by, you know, maybe human rights organizations could host a whistleblowing line for, for people within universities that develop these things or, you know, within companies even. So, so if there's a, a Pfizer scientist who wants to come out and, and call the whistleblowing line and say, I have this bit of recipe, uh, of the vaccine or, or things like that. That that's that's another thing that that we need to use creative ways to get to these things. Just because um, they're just not going to to happen with voluntary mechanisms. Okay, so another question. Um, advanced market commitments, the tool used by COVAX to get vaccines from sponsors, has been found inappropriate by some scholars, mainly because it puts COVAX into competition with deep-pocketed high-income countries. What has been your experience or observation with the uh, advanced market commitments? Thanks so much for this question, and it's a um, it's a it's a it's a real problematic one because. Um, one of the things that we've been concerned about is the UK, of course, dipping into the doses with, uh, with COVAX. And I've, you know, I've just been really, these are, Global South need the doses and the UK, and, and I live in the UK, and, and we have at least four or more, like some articles say seven, four, nine, uh, we have at least four or more doses per person. So the UK has completely overbought and, and, and monopolized the market. Um, and yet they got doses from, from COVAX. Now Gavi's response has been to the, uh, has been that they need to honor their agreements. Um, it's, it's of course problematic, you're correct. Um, and, and now we know better, but you, you, the, the the good thing is, I suppose, is that um, a lot of the countries who have overbought vaccines, they have enough vaccines for their countries, are now saying we don't want um, the allocation that was provided to us um, under the COVAX. So, so that's good, but it's voluntary. There's no way to compel them to say no to their COVAX doses, you know? And there are countries like the UK who will keep saying yes. Um, and this is obviously digging into the supply from the Global South. So definitely problematic. Do I have an answer to how to solve it for the next pandemic to not allow it? But for now, what do we do? Um, welcome to your suggestions. Okay, so we have time for one more question. I'm just going to, and we're gonna end here because I think that's a, that's a question that a lot of people have. Um, and it's about the boosters. Do folks within the accelerator worry about the impact of boosters on the global vaccine supply? Um, any counter strategies apart from the important statements that Dr. Tedros and other global health advocates have already made? counter strategies, you know, it's it's something that I'm sure my colleagues in the vaccines pillar are thinking about. Right now, our latest update is that, that you know, folks in the WHO are not going to uh, issue any recommendations on them at this stage. There is some evidence that, um, that they are beneficial for immunocompromised people, um, you know, that could be elderly people or people um, you know, cancer survivors and, and, and things like that, which is like, okay, fine, but it's clearly going to dig into to, to markets when most countries haven't even been vaccinated by 1%. It's so problematic. And uh, strategies, tough question. Maybe, maybe Matthew, you and I need to sit down and, and strategize together on, on how, to, um, how, to, how to solve these problems. Um, but it's it, it's a big question and, and question I don't actually have the answer to. 
but but it's an important one and, and we need to um, try to figure out but you know vaccine manufacturing in the global south is clearly clearly uh, something that we need to to, to think about um, it's it's the whole global, global health architecture and I know it sounds like a broken record but it, it is heavily broken and, and um, it's sort of pandemic profiteering we're seeing is is insane so um, more conversations to be had to get the to the answers. Um, thank you so very much. You have some uh, some uh, some thank yous in the in the chat as well from people. I think uh, uh, your talk was really well received, and we're very grateful for you for uh, taking the time uh, to join us today for our uh, for our seminar in this very important conversation. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, the uh, the the recording will be available on the YouTube video for those who want to rewatch or share. Um, and our next uh, our next seminar is going to be October eighth with uh, Dr. Holly Northam of University of Canberra talking about um, restorative approaches to remove institutional and professional barriers to uh, human flourishing. Also, is going to be. Um, online via Zoom. Uh, thank you again so much, Dr. Rahman. And uh, thank you for sharing uh, your knowledge and for the important work that you are doing. My and pleasure. And, and thanks so much for having me. Thank you.